Nancy, thank you very much indeed for reading. Please do keep um, James chapter 5 open in front of you. Uh, And there's an outline of the talk on the back of the notice sheet as well as there usually is. Um, Just as you're taking up the notice sheet, it'll be remiss of me not to say thank you um, to you all very much indeed for your uh, friendship over the years, for the support and encouragement that you've given to us as a family, for all of your kindness to us, um, your prayers, uh, your kindness to the children, and for the generosity of your leaving gift to us. We're very, very grateful indeed, and you will remain much in our prayers. But now to work once more. Um, They say that if you want to uh, embarrass a Christian, all you have to do is to ask them about their prayer life. I think that's probably true. While it's true that if you ask most of us about our holiness or um, the effectiveness with which we share our faith, we'll be pretty embarrassed by those questions too. But it probably is the subject of prayer that catches us out most of all. How often we pray, what we pray for, how long we pray for, how fervently we pray. I don't know a single Christian who thinks that they have prayer taped. And if we have a problem with prayer, we've noticed these weeks that so too did James's readers as we finish this little series in James today. Twice already in this letter, James has had to address the subject with them. If you um, just glance at the verses with me, back in chapter 1, verse 5. He said to them, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, let him pray. God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given to him, but, and you'll notice the slight rebuke, let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave that is of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. You, you don't always mean what you pray for, says James. You tell God that you want his wisdom so that you can go his way, but sometimes you don't really mean what you're praying. Uh, He returns to the subject, chapter 4, verse 2, the emotional heart of the letter. You do not have because you do not ask, or you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. It's no wonder that God isn't answering your prayers again, says James. Uh, Sometimes you don't pray at all. And when you do pray, look at your motives. You're not asking God for help to live out your faith in the world. Lots of the time, you're just asking for more money to spend on your passions. What do you expect God to do? So in the beginning, in the middle, and now again as he wraps up the whole letter, James returns to this subject of prayer. And you only have to glance through the little passage we're on this morning to see that the subject of it is prayer. Verse 13, uh, I'm in the right chapter, chapter 5, verse 13, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Verse 14, is anyone sick? Call the elders and let them pray. Verse 15, the prayer of faith. Verse 16, pray for one another because the prayer of a righteous man. 17, Elijah was a man like us and he prayed, verse 18, and he prayed again. Now I have to um, come clean, confess that when I saw that the subject of my last sermon at St. Helens was prayer, I felt a, a twinge of disappointment. I don't know why that is. I think I probably wanted to go out with a sort of tub-thumping, barnstorming challenge to you all, in which I reminded you of all of the resources that God has given you as a congregation and how he says of those to whom much has been given, much will be demanded. And so, St. Helens, open your eyes to the unique gospel opportunities that God has put in front of you. Go for it. Take some more risks for God. Step out in faith. Plant churches. Speak up for Christ to your neighbours. Train up more workers. Plant more churches. You can imagine the sort of thing I might have I might have said. Uh, that's not the subject of this sermon. But in comparison to all of it, 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 prayer just doesn't seem all that exciting. We know we're meant to pray and we're not very good at praying. So what else is there to say? But of course, the more we reflect on it, the more we realize that prayer is exactly the right thing for us to be thinking about this morning. Uh, if you've been with us these weeks, you'll know that um, I hope by now you're familiar with the big ambition that James has for his readers. In the midst of all of their trials, he wants them to persevere in a life of faithful and single-minded devotion 
to the Lord. Not just hearing God's word, but doing it, bearing the fruit of righteousness in their life, living as the first fruits of God's new creation until Christ returns and they receive the crown of life. That's his big ambition for them. And of course, it's exactly the same ambition that we should have for each other as Christians, whichever corner of the world we happen to be uh, living in. And if that is what we want for ourselves and for each other, then this conclusion of James that we've had a couple of weeks in, the two Ps, uh, tells us how to do it. Last week, be a patient people. And now climactically today, be a praying people. Because whatever comes our way in life, James wants us to pray. First point you'll see on the sheet, pray when you're suffering. And it's the first few words only. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. And of course, it's the obvious place for James to start with these readers. Um, He started the letter back in chapter 1, verse 2. Consider it all joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, when you meet trials of various kinds. Because the, the dominant life experience of James's readers was one of trial and suffering. And just to tie it down, I've been thinking about it again. I reckon that um, we've identified three particular kinds of trial being faced by James's readers. Some were just the, the struggles of life in a fallen world with which many here are all too familiar. Problems with work or the lack of it, money or the lack of it, uh, a spouse or children or the lack of them, disease, death, divorce. They knew just what it was like to live in a mucked up world. Then too, some of their suffering was specific Christian persecution. Um, lots of James's readers had started their Christian life living in Jerusalem with James as their pastor, the leader of the Jerusalem church. But when the Jewish authorities began persecuting the church, all of its members were left, were scattered out of Jerusalem and across the ancient world, leaving behind livelihoods, families, friends in lots of situations. They'd had to flee for their lives and James had witnessed their pain. But then as if that weren't enough, as we've read the letter, we've seen that at least some of James's readers were now on the receiving end of oppression within their own little congregations around the place. Uh, We met self-promoting gossip, self-sufficient pride, the the self-indulgent exploitation of fellow Christians that seemed to have taken hold within the congregation. And so it's with real understanding and compassion and knowing that he's hitting a nerve that James says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. And on one level, it sounds like the most obvious thing in the world because when life is hard, where, where better could you turn than to the all-loving and always faithful and all-powerful God? And yet, from your own experience, you'll know that when you are in pain, prayer doesn't always come that easily. Maybe there's a sense that we want to handle our problems ourselves, or the problem seems so intractable, so severe, that prayer feels like a waste of time. Or maybe we've we've let ourselves become angry with God and so we don't even want to talk to him. But James says there's no sense turning away from the God of comfort. Turn to him. Pray. Pour out your soul to him. Tell him how you feel. And he would say, make especially sure that on your list of things to pray for is the wisdom that's been right at the heart of this letter. That the heavenly wisdom of God's implanted word that enables us to learn from our suffering and to grow through it, that empowers us to remain steadfast in faith, to become perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Well, I don't know how life is for each of you at the moment. I know it's hard for some, but is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Uh, Because it's my last Sunday, it's not a bad time to say that one of the the biggest encouragements to us as a a couple over the last 15 years or so has been watching many of you do exactly that. 
um, looking around and seeing some faces. We've watched some of you live with any amount of physical and emotional pain over the years. But watching you remain steadfast under trial, holding on to the goodness of God and to the hope of heaven, and praying in faith in the midst of your pain has been a huge encouragement to us and a great lesson. And we would love you to pray for us as we will pray for you that when some new trial comes our way in the future, which it inevitably will, that God would give us the grace even then to trust and to pray. Second this morning, praise God when you're cheerful. The rest of verse 13, is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Because if there's a danger of not praying when you're in trouble, there's an equal and opposite danger uh, that when life is on a roll and work is going well and things are happy at home, that we don't bother to pray because we think we don't need to. But James has already taught us that all of the the laughter that we enjoy around our dining room tables, all of the good times we have with friends, the music we enjoy, the outdoors, our success at work, the children's achievements, all of those things are gifts from our good and perfect Father in heaven, all of them gifts from above. So while it's true that many in the our generation are happy to receive gifts from God, but are very slow to thank the giver, James says, well, in the good times, flip that on its head and acknowledge his hand in your happiness. Praise him. The word is literally psalm him, and it reminded me of Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. And like me, you may be familiar with that theology, but James would ask, well, do you just believe that God is the source of all the good things in your life? Or do you actually get around to praising him for it? Uh, I've been wondering just how much joy in the Holy Spirit we miss out on because we're so slow to praise our God. It strikes me that, that taken as a whole, there's a very simple beauty, an elegant beauty, I think, to verse 13. It just reminds us that the, the whole of life is to be lived in, in constant relationship with God. Every day, I guess, is either a happy day or a not-so-happy day. And James says, well, let every day be a praying day. If you're suffering, pray. If you're cheerful, praise. Uh, And that leads us into the third section of the passage, and it's much the longest from 14 down to the end. Let me read them. I'm calling this bit, Pray for the Spiritually Weak. Is anyone among you sick? Verse 14. Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it didn't rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Uh, Well, I wasn't particularly courting controversy today, but you may know that this section of our passage has been a source of enormous dispute over the years. The debate centers on the the type of sickness that James is talking about. Is it physical sickness, as it seems to be from just an initial glance at the words, or is it um, a sickness of the soul, what people call spiritual sickness? And uh, it may be that we end up coming to slightly different conclusions on these things, but I've uh, come to the view that James is very definitely talking about soul sickness. But um, just before I tell you why I think that, I want to stress that although I don't think James is talking about physical sickness here, we do, of course, nevertheless passionately believe that God can 
and does intervene in the world today to heal people from physical illness and disease. So as many of you know, when someone gets sick, as well as asking God to give them the wisdom to respond rightly to their trial, we pray for them. We pray regularly that God will be pleased to heal them, even when it looks entirely desperate as a situation. Of course, God never promises that if only we can generate enough faith within ourselves, that he will always heal his people. So that if you see someone sick and dying, you can rebuke their lack of faith, as you sometimes hear around the place. But nevertheless, it is right to pray, if it's God's will, that he would heal someone, uh, with or without the input of doctors and medicine. But that said, there are four reasons um, why I think in this context at least, James is talking about spiritual rather than physical sickness. Um, And I don't want to spend so long on the reasons that we don't listen to what James is actually saying, but it's an important debate. So reason one, Uh, just the words that James uses. Um, And to give you an idea of my methodology here, there are four or five key words that are under dispute in the passage. And a part of the way to work out what James is on about is just to look the words up in a good dictionary and to see how else they're used in the New Testament and in the letter of James in particular. And I've tried to show the fruit of that study in the little table on the sheet. Uh, Rather confusingly, there's two different Greek words that get translated sick in our translation. The first in verse 14 means weak. And that can refer either to physical or to spiritual weakness, as the references in the table show. Uh, The second word's a bit different. Uh, Literally, it means weary, um, and it crops up a couple of times in the New Testament. But in both cases, it very definitely is referring to spiritual weakness, growing weary in faith spiritually. I think it's even translated in that way in Hebrews. Uh, The word save in verse 15 is interesting because in the New Testament as a whole, it can mean being physically healed, or it can mean having your sins forgiven. But um, importantly here in James, the word crops up four other times, including just a few verses later. And on every occasion, it refers unambiguously to spiritual salvation. So by default, you'd expect it to have that sense here as well. The last word is healed. And again, in its context, it can mean either a physical healing or a spiritual healing. Look, all, all we've done is look up the words, and I've skated over a lot of it. But And the results don't prove conclusively one way or the other how you should understand the verses. But they show, I think, that uh, James could have been referring to either thing. And because of the second and third words in the table, they nudge me uh, just at the start towards um, an understanding that he's talking about praying for those who are sick in their soul. You could do the same with the phrase anointing with oil in verse 14. Um, I've got... So used to hearing that it was common medicinal practice back in the first century to rub oil on someone's stomach if you were sick, that I'd presume that that's what James was talking about here. But actually there's 78 occasions in the Bible, I think, where someone is anointed with oil. And in the, although it is occasionally used in the healing context, you'll see that in Mark 6, in the vast majority of the cases... Um, it refers to what um, Douglas Moo calls a, a physical act with a symbolic significance, specifically as someone is anointed, consecrated for the service of God, someone who, who maybe wasn't serving God before and then is set apart to serve him wholeheartedly. So again, it suggests a spiritual meaning here. Let me move on. Reason two is the immediate context of the passage. And whenever you get a tricky bit, look at what the writer says before and look at what he says after to see if that sheds any light on it. Immediately before, in verses 7 to 11, the subject was patience in the face of suffering, uh, persevering in faith, not throwing in the towel when times are hard. So the concern was spiritual. And then again, if you glance at 19 and 20, it's bringing back to the truth those who have wandered away from it so that their soul might be saved from death, again spiritual. That fits with reason three, which is the context of the the letter as a whole. Um, And we've seen that all the way through, James's concern is that some of his readers have slipped into a a spiritually disastrous state of double-mindedness. 
and he's concerned for the well-being of their soul. So you have to ask, which is more likely as James reaches the climax of his letter? That it suddenly chuck in a few random thoughts about prayer and healing, or that he would bring to a head the subject that he's been talking about all of the way through. We know already that he thinks that dependent prayer is a, a key to unlocking God's heavenly wisdom and being empowered to live wholeheartedly for God. So it just seems to make much more sense to me that James returns to that theme here. Uh, Reason four is the clincher for me. It's the example of Elijah in verses 16 to 18. Um, Everybody agrees that Elijah is being cited as an example of someone who prayed, a, a model for us to follow. But the interesting thing for me is the particular example from Elijah's life that James chooses to quote. Because if James were talking about physical healing, by far and away the best episode from Elijah's life for him to refer to would have been uh, a time in 1 Kings 17 when uh, he was staying at the house of a widow from Zarephath. If you know the story, um, uh, very sadly while he was staying there, the widow's son died and uh, she was devastated. But then the most wonderful thing happened because Elijah cried out to the Lord. He prayed... Uh, Let me get the words, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And God heard his prayer and brought the child back from the dead. So it's an amazing example of God intervening in the world to heal someone physically in the response to the prayer of a righteous man. But James doesn't pick that example. Uh, He goes instead for the time that Israel had become double-minded. Elijah describes them as limping between two opinions, unclear whether they should follow the Lord or Baal. And so to try and rouse them from their double-mindedness, Elijah prays and asks God to send a drought on Israel as a punishment for her spiritual half-heartedness. And God does for three and a half years. They have a big showdown on Mount Carmel. The people of Israel commit themselves to serving God again. Elijah prays again, and behold, the rains come and the earth bears fruit. So do you see the point? The example that James picks isn't about the power of prayer to heal the physically sick, although he could have picked that example. It's about the power of prayer to restore the spiritually wayward, because that's his big concern as he finishes the letter. Um, I hope we won't fall out if you disagree with me on that. If you've got any more questions about the reasoning, um, feel free to ask William next week uh, in my absence. So much for the reasons. The real question, I guess, is if that is what the verses are about, what is God saying to us uh, through them? And what he's saying is actually very simple. So if your neighbor dozed off, that was technical. I apologize for that. Well, I don't. But um, if your neighbor has dozed off and you've got the physical flexibility to kick them in the shins, then uh, now's a good time to do that because this bit is even more important. This is the message. If you yourself are spiritually weak, then you should ask your church leaders to pray for you. And if you know someone who's spiritually weak, then you should pray for them. I was chatting to someone recently who spent... uh, large part of the last few years, wandering away from the truth of Jesus Christ. Um, He looked as though he'd made a really good start in the Christian life. He was involved in leading other people. But there's no doubt that he had become double-minded as a Christian. And it could well be that there's someone else like that here this morning. Uh, We've all been challenged by studying James, but you've come to realize that it's It's more than that for you. That yours aren't just the the normal struggles of the Christian life. But you've begun to wake up at least to the fact that you are what James would call weary. Or sick spiritually. Double-minded. It could be any number of causes. It could be a particular trial. Uh, It could be money or the lack of it that's distracted you. You might have got out of the habit of hearing God's word and doing what it says. 
you may now even be on the verge of chucking in Christianity altogether and walking away from it. And if that is you, James says, don't. Don't throw in the towel. Instead, do what verse 14 says and ask the elders of the church, the leaders of the church, to pray for you. Uh, Find me afterwards if you want to pray. I'd love to do that. Uh, Ask Jamie, get hold of William sometime and say, I have mucked up. Um, I've I've stumbled into double-mindedness spiritually, either as a member of St. Helens or coming from somewhere else. But that's not the life that I want. I want to, to dedicate my life back to God again. Will you pray for me? Uh, When I was talking to this guy recently, I showed him verse 15. And I don't think I'd ever realized before how encouraging it is. Because it guarantees that if you come back to God uh, by asking your church leaders to pray for you in that way, if that's what you mean in your heart, that you're coming back to God with all of your heart, that you're going to go his way now, well, the faithful God will hear that prayer. He will save you. If it's a particular sin that's got you into trouble, he will forgive you. He will restore you spiritually and make you whole, perfect in his own sight. And on the last day, he will give you the crown of life. He is that good. He is that kind. So come and talk to one of us today. I I know that there'll be something in you that's saying, but that is the last thing that I want to do. And it is humbling to come and ask for help. But I want to assure you that no one here wants to humiliate you. Uh, No one will judge you. We'd just love to help you, uh, to pray for you, to assure you of God's forgiveness, to consecrate you once again to God's service, Um, not to anoint you with oil physically, but to pray for you as you dedicate your life back to God. There is nothing more important than persevering and receiving the crown of life. So come back to him today. Don't let anything get in the way of that. That's James's message for those who are themselves double-minded. But he ends the letter by encouraging everyone in the congregations to join him in actively looking out for the spiritual health of others. So verse 16 isn't addressed just to the leaders of the church. It's addressed to everyone. Confess your sins to one another, says James. Pray for one another that you may be healed. He's saying if you know someone who's struggling, either in a big way in the Christian life or just in a, in a little way like we all do, then take the time to see them. Uh, be honest with them about how you're going as a Christian. Ask them how they're going and pray for each other. I know a lot of this happens already in St. Helens, but I was challenged. It's easy, isn't it, to spend lots of time even if the subject of spiritual things comes up in our friendships, which it probably doesn't as much as it should, but even when it comes up, it's easy to spend a lot more time talking about how we're going spiritually without ever really getting around very much to praying for each other, except for in a passing way. But James says, pray fervently for each other, like Elijah did. Because God delights to hear the prayers of the people that he has made righteous. We tend to think that for God to use Elijah the way he did, there must have been something special about Elijah, something unique. And he was a prophet of God, but in this sense, he's just like anyone else. The opposite is true. James says he was just a human being like we are. He had a human nature like us. And the only reason he was so used of God for the spiritual good of his people was that he prayed. He prayed fervently. Literally, it reads, he prayed with prayer. He prayed prayerfully. So these verses are are like a, a little carrot being dangled in front of our eyes this morning. There is nothing at all 
to stop us from doing as much good for each other as Elijah did for Israel. If only we will pray. So then, St. Helens, will you pray fervently? You'll see why um, it's exactly the reminder that I need this week. Um, Tuesday's going to be a new start for us. We're moving to a different country. It it asks me, uh, what what kind of husband and father am I going to be as I move to a different place? Am I going to be a a real man? A real man who, being a real man obviously isn't about throwing a rugby ball around or running on a beach. It's about praying fervently for your wife, for your children. Am I going to be a real man who prays fervently for the spiritual well-being of my family? Ask me what kind of friend I'll be to you guys as I leave you behind. What kind of church leader will I be? up in St. Andrews. Will I pray fervently? It might be a question for all of us. Here's one to think about. Is it any wonder that we're not as single-minded as we might be as a generation of Christians if we're so slow to pray fervently for each other? So is fervent prayer the hallmark of your family, of your flat share? Is it the hallmark of your small group? Is it the hallmark of your friendship? If it isn't, husbands, leaders, brothers and sisters, uh, don't feel beaten up, but do be encouraged to change. All Elijah did was pray. And our generous God was only too delighted to answer. Um, I was saying goodbye to a friend uh, just on Friday. He's um, working in the Houses of Parliament now, and he showed me around. I hadn't been since I was at school. It was a whole lot of fun. Um, I'd forgotten that in one of the lobbies, there's a Latin inscription on the floor of Psalm 127, verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor it, those who build it, labor in vain. And it's a great irony in so many ways to see that text being trampled underfoot, literally, um, by so many politicians every day of the year. But I still think it's a lesson that many of us need to hear. Just think of all that God could accomplish among you and through you in the world, St. Helens, if we would give ourselves to prayer. It's the roadmap to single-minded devotion to Christ. Well, I'm delighted to end my time at St. Helens by encouraging you as a congregation to take the same kind of spiritual interest for each other that James has modeled to us in his letter. That's what verses 19 and 20 do. We'll end with these. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, which is what James thought his readers were doing, and someone brings him back, which is what he's been trying to do and what he wants us to do for each other, then let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover over a multitude of sins. May the God of grace be with us. Let me lead us in prayer. Well, Father, there's no good reason why we are so slow to pray. And yet again in this letter, we feel exposed and challenged by the example of James and of Elijah in particular. Forgive us, please. Unite our heart that we may serve you in single-minded devotion. Give us the wisdom we need, please, to be a patient people and to be a praying people. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. In Jesus' name, amen.